afternoon, South Africa. Welcome to Afternoon Express. I'm Bonnie Mbouli. It's the 1st of August, and that means it's the first day of Women's Month. And here on Afternoon Express, we'll be celebrating the strong women in South Africa who are making a positive difference. And today's show, we're starting off with you, the moms out there, who put in the hard work every day to raise our next generation. Wintertime means colds and flu. And as a parent, I know all too well the burden it puts on kids who have to miss school as a working mom. It can be quite stressful. I'm actually quite nervous about my son right now because he's um, he's sneezing, he's coughing, and I'm trying to nip it in the bud. Today we're focusing on a breakthrough study in the fight against colds and flus in children. It's also start of breastfeeding awareness week, and today we'll be highlighting the importance of breastfeeding, not only for babies' health, but for moms as well. Now recently Afternoon Express visited Switzerland to find out all about the Echinacea flower and how it is used to treat and prevent colds and, and flus in the form of A. Vogel's Echinophores. There were also some exciting new research results released and we chatted to Dr. Andy Suter, head of the medical department and product development for BioForce. It all starts with a virus. Somewhere there's a, this very small particle of a virus that you have in the majority on your hand and then you touch yourself because we touch all the time our faces. Um, you come to your nose, for example, and then the infection starts. You know, the virus nests in, in your mucous membrane here and then it starts to replicate. And afterwards, you have then the whole inflammatory response. This is the response from the immune system to, to get rid of the virus. So all the symptoms you have, like uh, sneezing and what have you, that's the answer from the, from the immune system. You are doing this, not the virus itself. And then what the virus does, you know, if this is the virus you have on the cells, a receptor, and the virus attaches this to, to the receptor, and like this, it enters the cell, and it uses the cell like a copy machine for itself, and out come new viruses. Now, what these viruses are doing, they are infecting again cells and cells and again. It's like a chain reaction. Now, what the Kinophores can do, it really can block this, this uh, connection here to the receptor, and therefore the virus cannot block here, you know. Joining us this afternoon in the loft to discuss the topic of colds and flu is Dr. David Nordier, who specializes in natural medicine. And if you'd like to weigh in on the conversation, please feel free to do so at any point and call us on 021-430-9881. Good afternoon, Dr. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, lovely to have you here with us. So what is the difference between treating um, illness with natural medicine and, say, just normal pharma pharmaceuticals? Well, with natural remedies, they typically work with the body to correct an imbalance as opposed to forcing the body into doing something. So they help to re-establish a balance and most of the philosophies around natural remedies are about finding the root cause of an illness ah. as opposed to just suppressing symptoms. Yeah. So tell us about this special ingredient, Echinacea. What does it do and what makes it so special? Well, there's a lot of evidence that confirms that it's antibacterial, antiviral, and anti-inflammatory. Anti um, and what's interesting is most of the symptoms that you get when you have a respiratory tract infection are actually caused by the inflammation that a virus causes. And this is one of the beauties with echinacea is it can actually kill the virus, but can also reduce the inflammation that that virus has caused. Wow, okay. So that's and, quite profound. And, and I've learned that inflammation causes a lot of havoc in the body. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Too much inflammation is a bad thing. Yes. So what is the difference between colds and flus? I've always been so confused when people say, I've got a cold, it's not a flu, or it's definitely a flu now. Yeah, I think people use the word flu, um, you know, excessively For most everything. of the time. Correct, and it's actually probably just a head cold or a rhinovirus. Um, so there are some shared symptoms like a runny nose, sore throat, maybe some sinus congestion, and cough. But influenza is typically characterised by fever, body aches and pains. You know, you get that hypersensitive mm. skin as one of the other symptoms. So mm -hmm. it's, the symptoms are more intense and they typically last longer with the influenza. Right. And there's also some myths surrounding how people get flus or get colds. And I know um, our mothers always used to say, now I say to my kids, put on a sweater, put on a jersey, put on your shoes, you're going to get cold and then you're going to get sick. Um, and it's apparently not true, and we've been told over and over that it's not true, but we won't stop believing it. Yeah, I think it's nice to tell your children that, to get them to listen, <laughs> yeah. um, but they, actually it's a myth. There isn't any evidence that correlates, you know, walking in the rain or in the cold causing an infection. But in winter, typically, um, when temperatures are cold and the air is drier, this is the more conducive for influenza virus because the virus is more stable outside the body at lower temperatures. And in a more dry environment, the little droplets um, that we breathe in that contain the virus can stay in the air longer. So that's typically why we pick up, 
influenza more in winter time. Wow. Okay, we're going to still chat a little bit more about the echinacea force and all the um, breakthroughs that have been discovered about it lately. So stay tuned for more because we have a lot more on colds and flu. And then a little later, we discuss the big breakthrough study. We'll be back with more from Dr. Nordia after the break. The break. Plus, we head to the kitchen with guest chef Anne Shindell to make Sloppy Joe sweet potatoes. A. Vogel's Echinophores is the world's strongest herbal product that's clinically proven to prevent and treat colds, flu and their complications. Welcome back. We're running an exciting competition this week where you could walk away with an awesome prize from Comfitex, including a designer handbag, luxurious spa voucher, 2,000 Rand cash, and a Comfitex hamper to the total value of 5,000 Rand. SMS win to double three six five zero. Vast rates apply. T's and C's apply as well. Visit afternoonexpress.co.za. Introducing Clover Care the first enriched milk packed with nutrients to help you take extra care of your whole family. Made with love by Clover. Okay, milk is enriched with nutrients that are typically lacking in our diets. It also quite, it's quite versatile to use in cooking and baking, or it can be enjoyed on its own. So treat your family to a healthy boost with the Sloppy Joe sweet potato dish. To get the list of ingredients you'll need for this recipe, SMS the keyword Clover to 33650. Welcome, Anjan. How are you? you? Very good. In Lovely yourself. to have you with us. Wonderful. So I'm so excited about these Sloppy Joes. Yeah, exactly. And we're using sweet potato, like we mentioned. And mm -hmm. I mean, 
mean, it's like just so good for you, you know, like Healthy. nutritionally. Um, yes. It's like benting and low GI and all those wonderful things. It's got beta all the carotene. Stuff we want. Um, but yes, let's just get cracking with our recipe. Um, so we've got onions going here. Okay. And then I'm just putting in some beautiful roasted garlic for some nice flavor. And then I'm going to just add the mushrooms one time as well. Right. So in goes our mushrooms. So we just fried up our, our onion a little bit. Yeah, just mm -hmm. to get them a bit soft, a bit translucent as well, you know, also yeah. just to release it. I see you roasted flavor. your garlic as well. I think so, you know, because okay. it just like, it's so much more flavorful yes, when you do yes. this, I think. Yeah. And just like the fragrance that comes from that is Absolutely. beautiful. Absolutely. So I think that's preferable to and just roast the garlic. And garlic is a, a mission bit. to chop. It, it certainly is. Um, <laughs> so you but have you to know have when you like skills. just like pack it away in your oven, like, and Put it in a bit of foil and then it just does its own thing yeah. there and then it comes out and you sort of just like pop it out. Yeah. So it's much easier to handle, I think, when yeah, you roast it. Yeah, I agree. It. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so that's going. Um, and I think while that's going, why not just put in the kale? Okay. Um, and today, yes, we're using kale. It's beautiful greens, very high in wow. calcium. Wow. And it's got a bit of iron in there too. So um, really just a recipe that's like so, so good for you. I didn't um, actually realize if you chop up kale really small, you can actually add it to anything. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I think maybe you don't necessarily have to fry it as much. You could probably yes. just like saute it quickly. Yes. Um, and then just give it a bit of flavor with your olive oil and enjoy it on a salad. Like, I really love doing a, a warm kale salad um, with a bit of spinach and then our chicken as well. Thank you. Just a bit of our chicken. And we've shredded the chicken so yeah. that that's also just a bit easier to... Okay. To handle. And obviously the star of this recipe is the clover care milk. Yes. Um, and when do and we then add that? We're going to add some of that in there. Okay. And then I'm also just going to need a bit of cornstarch. Okay. And, and we're using... Shall I pour it in? To, yeah. Yes, please. Um, and then I'm just going to lower the heat slightly. Right. Do you need more? And then if we can just get the cornstarch, corn you, you can put about half of that in there. Okay. And what does the cornstarch do? You know what? It's, it's a great gluten-free option. So that's why right. we're using that today. And you don't necessarily need as much of it. I think that's perfect. Okay. Because you just want it to, like, bind everything together. So and that's what gives it that creamy texture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so already you can see it's, like, coming together quite nicely. Absolutely. Okay, just give it a bit of a toss. Yeah, yeah. And then just a little bit more seasoning. A little bit more seasoning. So I see so here you've bit. got one that's already made. Yes, yeah, so that's with our onions, our garlic, our shredded chicken in there, and clover care as well. Wow, it smells amazing. And it I actually can't does. wait to try yeah. some. And so at some, at, when it's all ready, you just pop into your sweet potato? You can do that. You just like put spoonfuls in there and like fill it up right to the top <laughs> and then just enjoy it like you would a sloppy joe. Wow, I'm definitely going to try this because it's quite quick and easy. Yes. And it's quite simple uh, to make and it's a great midweek dinner. Remember to SMS Clover to 33650 to get this recipe sent to you. And if you missed any of these steps, here's a quick recap. Now, the topic of today's show is colds and flu, and recently we chatted with Dr. Roland Shoup, the medical advisor for A. Vogel Bioforce, and Dr. Ross Walton, the MD of Therapeutic Frontier at Imperial College in London. Normally, a cold and flu starts with a viral infection. When your immune system is in a good shape, is well prepared, then normally this infection lasts seven days up to 10 days. 
When your immune system is really struggling with the virus, is really having a hard time to clear the infection, after six days you might go into a secondary complication. And then it's not just viral, then a bacteria might add and then you get a super infection. And then we talk about pneumonia, we talk about bronchitis, we're talking about sinusitis. And these are very severe infections. So the aim of these in vitro studies was really to try and understand the mechanisms by which Kinoforce is able to reduce some of the symptoms you might get when you get a common cold, and also suppress some of the downstream effects following the cold, which can leave you open to secondary bacterial infections, such as sinusitis, lower airway involvement, bronchitis, those more severe infections that you might get, which actually are the real complications following a common cold. Welcome back. So often, Colds and flus um, escalate or, and, 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 and are prolonged and they become secondary infections. So wh what happens in that case? Well, what research has shown is that when you get a viral infection and you have that inflammatory reaction that the virus causes, this inflammation results in the lining of your airways producing bacterial receptors. And these receptors are actually like little docking stations. So the bacteria that are in the system can now attached to the airway and then cause a secondary bacterial infection. So that's when you end up with a bronchitis or an ear infection or tonsillitis and this is often where antibiotics become necessary. Right, right. And why is it important to reduce the length of a cold or, or the flu and is fever good or bad? Well look, in terms of the length of colds and flus, we have something called immune exhaustion. So every time you get an infection, for every day that you're ill and your body's fighting that infection, your body's draining its immune ah. system and its natural anti-inflammatory mechanisms. So if you drain that process completely, it leaves you more vulnerable and then you pick up a secondary infection or mm. when you're exposed again, you get sick more easily. Mm. Right. In terms of fevers, um, you don't want to suppress a fever too early on because when your body produces a fever, it's a hostile environment for bacteria and viruses. So in that hostile environment, they can't replicate as easily. So if you suppress that fever, it's like taking the handbrake off. Bacteria and viruses can just replicate freely. Wow. Sure. So interesting. Now let's look how the overuse of antibiotics can affect our health. Dr. Peter Fisher, Research Director from Royal London Hospital for Integrated Medicine, shed some light. We have a really big global crisis of antimicrobial resistance. And note that I say antimicrobial, not antibiotic, because although antibiotics are the main drugs, there are also antiviral agents. Um, which are important in this context because most respiratory tract infections are viral and resistance to them is also emerging. And we have a really big problem, global problem. People are dying already and many more are going to die from antibiotic resistance. So we need to find strategies for reducing antibiotic resistance. And the existing strategies are actually remarkably unimaginative. They're convergent. They say, you know, we've got to do more of the same, only better. And we need to invent new antibiotics. There hasn't been a new class of antibiotics introduced in over 30 years. So what we need is, is alternatives, particularly for the vulnerable groups. And the vulnerable groups are the very young and the very old. The problem is you get a viral infection, particularly in children, and it can then develop into something, maybe to croup, maybe to pneumonia, something really serious. And you need to head that off at the pass. You need to stop that happening. Now, Doctor, how can the overuse of um, antibiotics affect our health? Well, it becomes a problem when you prescribe an antibiotic for a viral infection. I think a lot of people don't realize that an antibiotic can't do anything for a virus. In actual fact, giving an antibiotic in a viral scenario can actually do more harm because the antibiotic uh, has a detrimental effect on your natural bacteria that live in your intestine. And these bacteria are major role players in your immune response. So by taking an antibiotic unnecessarily, you actually set yourself you know, foot backwards in terms of immune reaction. So this, it can be counterproductive. Um, and then obviously with a lot of evidence now and more and more commonly, we're encountering multiple drug resistant bacteria. So as Dr. Fisher was saying, bacteria just aren't responding to antibiotics anymore. Wow. Um, and this is becoming a major issue and antibiotics are just not as effective as they were. And would you say that there's always an alternative to an antibiotic? Look, it depends on the type of infection. Antibiotics have their place, yes. uh, and in severe bacterial infections, they are necessary, but they shouldn't, certainly shouldn't be prescribed uh, uh, you know, based on a guess mm. or in a viral scenario. That's what leads to bacterial uh, drug resistance. Yeah, and what, do you, what would you say are the effects of our modern lifestyles on children and their immune systems? Well, look, I mean, there's a lot of information that tells us that children are actually too clean these days. 
wow. uh, which is, you know, it sounds like a bit of an irony, but being too clean uh, and not allowing our immune systems to actually be exposed to certain things is actually counterproductive as well. Because every time your immune system does encounter uh, a pathogen, it learns how to react to that so that next time it's more capable of defending itself. So being too clean is an issue, and obviously diet is a major factor as well. Um, our diets aren't what they were. We have less whole foods. We mm. have less uh, fermented foods in our diet. And this also has an effect on our microbiome, the bacteria in the intestine, which compromises our immune system. Wow. Yeah, I've recently learned a lot about the biome, and it's, it's very interesting a stuff. A hot topic. Yeah. So after the break, catch up with one of the adorable pups that was adopted right here on Afternoon Express, and we continue the conversation with Dr. Nord here. Hey Vogels, Akinaforce is the world's strongest herbal product that's clinically proven to prevent and treat colds, flu, and their complications. Whiskers, feed their curiosity. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, Donut recently caught up with another rescue pup, Agape, who was adopted after being featured right here on Afternoon Express. Take a look. Since the arrival of Baxter and Donut into the Afternoon Express family, we've given a lot of focus to rescue animals. We've had a great success in helping find homes for the animals featured on the show. And today, Donut is visiting one of these rescues at her home in Musenberg. When we first saw Mila, she's now called Agape, and we saw her on the Afternoon Express social media pages. Um, she was really cute. <laughs> and yeah, we saw this organization, we did some research, and seeing her on Afternoon Express show, we figured she's quite a popular puppy. <laughs> and we just thought that it was good to help out a good cause. We changed her name from Mila to Agape, just so that she could get accustomed to her new family and it's the Greek word for love and she's such a lovable dog and that's why we chose that name. I had dogs growing up. I grew up in Johannesburg and I've always loved dogs. I've always had dogs around me and then when we moved into this place, I work from home. So we just decided that we would help out some dog that needed a place to live and just to have company for me while I'm working at home. 
So we live in Musenberg in a ground floor flat across the road from the beach. So we, we take her there almost every single day. And since Donna came to visit, I thought it would be a nice place for them to go and play around and get to know each other a little bit better. After being rescued from De Duerans in the Western Cape, Agape was featured on the show and immediately adopted. Agape is now living her best life close to her favorite playground, the beach. We're down at the beach, they're having loads and loads of fun. Agape loves the beach. She loves playing around with the culp. I throw the culp for her and she runs and gets it back. She's always been really cautious about getting in the water, but today with Donut, she actually got in, which I'm really pleased about, because I want her to be comfortable around the water. So when we first got her, she had a condition called megaesophagus, and she's now completely fine. As you can see, she's running on the beach, having fun rolling around in the sand. So she's completely fine now and healthy. I definitely would recommend adopting a dog. There's just so many dogs out there that need homes. And as long as you just shower them in love and affection, you know, they'll turn out to be your family. Since we've got Agape, she's changed our life hugely. She's just so much love in our family and we go out more, we do more adventurous stuff. She goes out with us everywhere. We take on holidays with us and yeah, we just do everything with her. It's so nice to have another adopted dog, rescue dog with us. They're having a lot of fun on the beach. And thank you to Donut for bringing some lovely pedigree treats for Agape. Besides gaining a best friend by adopting an animal, you're also saving a life. With so many rescue animals needing homes, we encourage you to talk to your local shelter about how you can help. I'm so happy for Agape. So Afternoon Express recently visited Switzerland to hear the results of a first-time study of A. Vogel Echinophorus' ability to prevent and treat colds and flus in children. There are very few studies done on cold and flu medications in children, partly because there are so many regulatory hoops to jump through. But now for the first time, the world has clinical proof of the effectiveness of echino e e echinacea in children in the form of A. Vogel's Echinophorus. <laughs> This study is so important because it's the first study of Echinacea in children and we only have data from adults. The aim of the latest study was to figure out whether the amount of respiratory tract infections in children could be reduced. It was conducted in the winter 2016 and 17 with 203 children 13 pediatricians and general practitioners all over Switzerland participate. We recruit children in between the age of 4 and 12 years and we were lucky because the mean age was 8 years and we had 40% of the children who um, are under 6 years old. 92% of them went to kindergarten and school. So this was important for us because then they have a lot of contacts with germs like virus, infections. And the children got Echinacea for two months with one week break and then again for two months, three times a day a tablet with four 400 milligram Echinacea extract. Welcome back. So, Doctor, what is the difference between um, conducting studies to prove the effectiveness of, of traditional uh, medication versus natural medication? Does it take longer to prove the effectiveness of, of natural medication? Not, no. Um, there actually isn't very much difference. Certainly when, you, when you're planning clinical trial, whether it's on orthodox medicine or a complementary medicine, they still have to go through the same regulatory checks, ethical approval, uh, you know, a medicine control council, um, and, and in Switzerland, uh, what they call Swiss Pharma. So they're the same regulatory hoops as, as we mentioned. Um, and, you know, these studies all have to stand up to scrutiny. You know, they all have to follow what we call the scientific method. Yeah. Uh, and this particular study did exactly that. Wow. And wh what is the importance of this study? Just well, in the as you've heard, it's, things, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As you've heard, it's the first evidence that we have of echinacea's effectiveness in children. Um, there's so much evidence confirming its usefulness as a treatment and a prevention in adults. But we didn't know what the effect would be in children, although we could assume it would be similar. Um, so in this study, what they found was that the children who received the echinacea product um, had one third less colds and flus than the control group. That's, that's significant. So a third less colds and flu over a four, a four month period in winter. And what they also found is that the children who had the echinacea had 67% less days of fever, which is also mm. significant. Um, and fever is a, a hot topic and, and certainly children 
typically aren't allowed to go to school if they have a fever. So yeah. if you reduce fever, then there's less days of missed school. Um, the study also found 64% reduction in secondary bacterial complications. Right. So that's your sinusitis, your low respiratory tract infections, bronchitis, pneumonia. These are all the things, the scenarios where antibiotics typically become necessary. So by, by using a preventative uh, product like Echinacea, you can avoid the, the, the need for antibiotics, which is tremendous. Mm. I mean, the World Health Organization is putting pressure on physicians around the world to reduce the prescribing of antibiotics unnecessarily, and this may be an option. Yeah. And then um, last, but, last but not least is an overall reduction in the need of antibiotics um, by 74%. So these children who took echinacea during that winter period needed um, 73 rather um, percent less antibiotics than those who didn't. And yeah. that's absolutely outstanding. Yeah. Wow. I mean, as a, as a mom, I know that when my children get sick, um, I immediately want to stop um, the visible <laughs> effects of the, of the illness. And sometimes I think parents get nervous that natural medicine takes longer to see the results, right? And maybe they feel like they'll have to watch their children in pain. What can you say to reassure them and, and just give them confidence in using a natural product? Well, look, I mean, the, the, the science speaks for itself. I mean, the active ingredient in echinacea, if you take an oral dose, you can measure it in your blood within 15 minutes. So within 15 wow. minutes, that active ingredient called al alkylamide is, is detectable in your blood and it stays in your bloodstream for up to 180 minutes. So it's quick acting, and that is the actual substance that has the anti-inflammatory effect for the airways. So echinacea is quick acting, um, and, and there's a significant amount of evidence that confirms that. Wow. Well, my, my little one is um, showing signs of getting a cold, and I'm definitely going to get a bottle after this. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. So truly a remarkable breakthrough study for Echinoforce and the benefits of using echinacea to help prevent and treat colds and flus in children. Echinoforce makes fighting off colds and flu a little easier for the whole family. And if you're a mother, I'm sure you're practically doing cartwheels at those results. I know I am. I'm so excited. A third fewer cold and flu infections, 67% fewer cold and flu complications, and 73% less need for antibiotics. Yay. That's a lot less days off school for your child and less medical bills for you. A real win-win situation, isn't it? And the fact that a natural product can do this, well, that's just ticking all the boxes. Hey Vogel's Echinoforce is the world's strongest herbal product that's clinically proven to prevent and treat colds, flu and their complications.
Welcome back to Afternoon Express. I'm in the kitchen with my fave, Clem. Every foodie knows that Thai flavors are making a breakthrough this year. And with Clem's mouth-watering hashtag for the love of winter, Thai sweet corn fritters served with a sweet chili dipping sauce mm, on your menu. You can't go wrong. Plus, healthy eating has never looked so good. Because normally these guys are deep fried. And you yeah. guys are talking about everything healthy. And, you Everything's know, we gotta, conscious. We have it. Yeah, so we're getting like, better. I can't be deep frying things today. So what I've no. done is I've actually taken the, the same batter, modified it slightly, and made it perfect for actually a waffle iron. Yes. A waffle uh -huh. iron. But not everybody has a waffle oh, iron, so I no. could you, A waffle iron, you mean like those, yeah, yes. the ones that close up. Exactly. Because so you don't need any extra fat. I love you. Uh -huh. So I've got yeah. a Rhodes quality corn that's going in there. Right. Then I've got some mixed veggies in the can with the curry sauce, and you use that curry sauce because that's going to be extra flavor. Okay. And you'll notice there's not a lot of moisture in this one because we're actually going to use the moisture from our mixed veggies and from our egg. And I just liked it that I didn't need to get out a tin opener. I see this. Because those are so like 1970s. Oh, tin openers. I we just need them. to like remove them from the world, okay? And then there's some that like you have that you just can't use. You're like, how do I use this again? Uh, no, uh, it's uh, just uh, don't. Just, anyway. just actually don't, yeah. One egg going in. One egg, okay. And then we're gonna go. And in. these are quality vegetables. And it's not. There's no preservatives. The goodness is in the can. So there's no, no preservatives. preservatives. Yeah. Qua the ingredients are picked. Bad word. Very bad word. <laughs> the ingredients are picked that? at their prime, and mm -hmm. it goes into the can, and that's it. And that's it. That's yeah. It. This is some green Thai curry paste. I just went in there because I want to make it a little spicy. Yeah. You can totally go and add some extra chili flakes if you want to make it extra spicy. Obviously, if you're making it for the kids, you just have to watch out for the for the spicy. You say the that. The minute eh? they taste spicy, they just uh -huh. complain. They just. Oh, do you, do you like, like do your Their boys not like? Their faces go like, all like, mommy, this is spicy. Oh, okay. I mean, my children call um, sparkling water spicy. They're You're like, joking. Mommy, this is spicy. That is very interesting. And I'm like, you mean it's sparkling? Yeah. It's sparkling. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, I used to like go crazy for spicy foods. Did you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now, that, now I know what's hap what happened to you. <laughs> yeah. Cool. You're That's the batter. One. That's the batter done. Okay. I like to let it sit for a little bit to let all that dry ingredients absorb all the, yeah. the flour and the moisture from the actual sauce. So here's one I got a little earlier. Super easy. If you have a waffle iron at home, pop it in there, lid down, let it do its thing. If you don't, griddle yeah. pan's also great. If you don't have a griddle pan, a little bit of kitchen spray in a pan and you're good. Yeah. The idea is we're just not going to fry these bad boys. Yeah, and I know we, we all need to be uh, gluten-free conscious because there's a lot of people who just deciding not to include uh -huh. gluten in their diets. And I think because you've used corn flour here, we could use a, re a replacement like tapioca exactly. or pea flour uh -huh. or and chickpea take, flour. Yes, I love chan of chickpea flour, chan of flour. Yeah. flour. So yeah. take, the, take the normal um, wheat flour out of there. Yes. And then maybe put in that extra tapioca, that chickpea flour. Yes. And it gives a nice texture and taste as well. I really love that. It does. So, you know the rule of pancakes, right? Only touch it, only turn it over once you see little bubbles forming on the top. Same Otherwise thing with leave this. it. Let it do its thing. You get, I, can, I see one bubble popping up already. I'm going to let it do its thing. You get, it'll let you know when it's done. Yeah, because this you is take, quite a thick batter, so yeah. you've got to... It'll yeah. let you know when it's done. We need to actually move it around, and then it just comes with the surface by itself. Yes. Turn it over, yes. give it another minute and a half. Look at those bad boys. I'm sorry, but I actually think I they'll, taste, they'll taste as good as the ones that are deep fried. I'm going to taste this. Yeah, and, and actually, for my, my chili dipping sauce, it's a lot of lime. I'm I gonna... love a lot of lime. Ooh. So that's lime, sweet chili, soy sauce, a little ginger, a little garlic, a little chili. How are you feeling? How's that mm. sauce? How I the love fritters. It. I love it. Done. It's so comforting. And you can make this whole thing. I say, if you have everything in front of you, you can go from beginning, of, from scratch, to dinner in like 20 minutes. Minimal, minimalist ingredients. Yeah, focus on the quality of the ingredients. So that's inside it. the can already, and then you're done. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm <laughs> the Rose Quality hashtag for the Love of Winter competition is here, and you stand the chance to win one of six 5,000 Rand weekly prizes and a chance at the 100,000 Rand grand prize. All you have to do is share a picture and recipe of your Rhodes Quality Winter Dish with hashtag for the love of winter on the Rhodes Quality Facebook or Instagram page. Entries are open until the 16th of August. And after that, celebrity chef Zola Nena will pick the two winning entries who will battle it out for the grand prize. T's and C's apply. Visit RhodesQuality.com. Roads Quality, for the love of winter. <laughs> so today marks the first day of World Breastfeeding Awareness Week. 
which will run until the 7th of August. Breastfeeding is a, universally, a universal solution that levels the playing field, giving everyone a fair start in life. It improves the health, well-being and survival of women and children around the world. But it seems that more and more women are opting to not breastfeed their children for various reasons. To discuss this pertinent topic, we're joined by a dietitian, Abigail Courtney. Welcome, Abigail. Hi, hi. <laughs> so why are women opting out of breastfeeding? Gosh, you know, I think breastfeeding, initially, when you start breastfeeding just after you've had your baby, it's difficult. It's, it's hard, you know. There's, there's a really lovely saying that breastfeeding is natural, but it doesn't come naturally, mm. you know. And, and I personally think one of the huge obstacles that we're facing perhaps as a country or as as the world perhaps is that breastfeeding is not seen you know we don't live in a breastfeeding culture so we're not aware of it we're we're not exposed to it on a regular basis so it's a bit foreign to us you know yeah. and I think if we made it a little bit more uh, you know so if everybody was doing it it wouldn't be as difficult as yeah. it is right now you know so so that's something that I think World Breastfeeding Week really helps to advocate for is that you know we need to we need to see more breast feeding so that we can actually increase those breastfeeding rates. Absolutely. I mean, I, I breastfed my babies and I really just found it, apart from just the, the health benefits, mm -hmm. the nutri nutritional benefits, mm. it was also such a beautiful intimacy. Mm. You really bonding. developed a beautiful yeah. uh, bonding with your, with your child. But Definitely. obviously we don't want to mm. talk about the, the, the beauty of breastfeeding mm. and feel like women who aren't breastfeeding are being mm. judged. Mm. But what are the, the if the, sometimes or not breastfeeding is linked mm. to underweight or mm. overweight children. Mm. What are some of the other effects yep. of not breastfeeding your child? Well, you've got to think about it. That breast milk is custom made for that baby. So the mom creates specific milk for her child and so wow. it's got enough macronutrients enough micronutrients specific to that child they've actually done studies where they found that the milk for a little girl might actually be different from the milk for a little boy you know so wow. the, the changes in the breast milk are significant and are, outsta are outstanding you know Breast milk is actually a living tissue. It's actually alive and, and it's, it's the golden standard, you know. So when a mother breastfeeds, and the recommendation for breastfeeding is exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life. So that means no other food or drinks or not even water. Your baby needs absolutely nothing for the first six months of life. Um, and it provides absolutely everything that your child needs yeah. in the right quantities yeah. as well, you know. So uh, reducing the risk of malnutrition. And remember when we speak about malnutrition, nutrition we're not just talking about children who are underweight. We're talking about children who are overweight as well. Because remember, malnutrition can be can go both ways. You know, yes. we're sitting at the moment with what we call a double-edged sword, where people are malnourished but they're overweight because they're consuming mm. a lot of poor quality foods and they're not getting the micronutrients that, that they need. Mm. And that's actually got the term. It's called hidden hunger. So, um, wow. and it's it's what we are facing as a as a nation. As a nation, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's there's this assumption that breastfeeding uh, causes a mother to lose a lot of nutrients mm. or lose a lot of weight for mm. mothers who don't want to lose weight but I know yep. most moms want to lose yep. weight after they had a baby. <laughs> um, can you clear up some of those? Yep. Um, well remember during pregnancy a woman picks up weight a lot of that weight is obviously the baby the amniotic fluid her breasts increase in size you know so so a lot of that weight can be accounted for but she does gain a little bit of fat some women more than others you know normally about two or three kilograms and that weight actually carries her through the breastfeeding period so mm. it's kind of extra energy for when she needs to breastfeed. From a nutritional, sort of like a micronutrient point of view, you know, I, I always encourage mommies and I say to them, look, eat a healthy diet, continue with your multivitamin or your, your multivitamin shake, something like a Similac Mom or something like that, and, and then you pretty much are okay, you know, but it, the variety is key. And an interesting thing about breastfeeding is that the, the milk will not suffer. So the quality of the milk won't change, but the mother might suffer. So the mom is never worried that her baby's not gonna get the best quality of her diet is not that great, but she might then be at a higher risk of micronutrient deficiencies herself. Yeah. Especially pertinent nutrients like calcium, you know, things that are often leached from the mother's body. So I think in terms of losing weight, the mommy probably, you know, doesn't need to worry too much about that. And if she is losing weight more than what she would like, is then she just needs to really focus on the quality and quantity of the food that she's eating. Um, and then from a, a micronutrient point of view, just to make sure she's covered in that respect yeah. from variety and then also supplementation. Yeah.
We've been having a conversation on the couch with Dr. Nuria mm. about mm. The, mm. the benefits of Echina Force. Mm. Can you share any thoughts on that? Mm. So my recommendation with any type of supplement, be it a nutritional supplement, be it a medical supplement, a natural supplement, is always just to run it past your healthcare professional. You know, so whether it's your gynecologist, your pediatrician, your naturopath or your chiropractor um, or your homeopath or your dietitian or your sister, your clinic sister, just run it past them. You know, yeah. I think that's always really good solid advice because remember each person is an individual and it depends on what other medications you're taking, what your diet is like, you yes. know, what are the reasons that you want to take these certain supplements. Um, and that's why you need to take it on a case by case basis. Um, that's my opinion. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope um, we'll see more and more women breastfeeding and we'll see more and more <clears throat> women feeling comfortable to breastfeed in public. Exactly. Well. Exactly. And just yes. making it the norm, you know, that's, yeah. that's really what I want women to strive for is making this, making breastfeeding completely normal, normal, yes. normalizing Absolutely. it. I think that's what we need to, to aim yeah. for. Well, we'll be back after the break with more from our guests. And if you have any questions for us, do call us. Don't hesitate. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Today's show has been all about the health and wellness of moms and their children with a specific focus on colds and flu and the benefits of breastfeeding. We're back now with our experts, Dr. David Nordier and dietitian Abigail Courtenay. Welcome back to the couch. So, and I think a lot, a lot of mothers think about this and they maybe feel like it's a stupid question to ask, especially when breastfeeding. If a mom has a cold or a flu, uh, can they pass on and infect the child? Can I take that one? Yes, yeah. Sure. So, so look, I think breastfeeding is definitely encouraged, whether the mother or the baby is sick. You know, so continued breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. What I always encourage my patients is I just say uh, follow good hi uh, hand hygiene. So wash your hands. Make sure that if you've blowed your nose, that you go and wash your hands before you touch your baby. You know, and if you're coughing and sneezing, just try not to cough and sneeze on your baby. Sure. You know, but it is definitely recommended that you continue breastfeeding. And if the baby does get sick, then to continue breastfeeding throughout the illness. You yeah. Know, because like like we said, breastfeeding is the perfect nutrients um, and the perfect food for the baby and provides enough fluid and enough uh, macronutrients, mi micronutrients, so definitely just to continue. Just to continue. Mm. Okay, awesome. We have a caller on the line, Estelle. Welcome to Afternoon yes. Express. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are yourself? I'm well. What is your question or comment? No, I would just like to kind doctor to answer it because I tried to find this morning but I was a little bit out of time. Mm -hmm. um, I have two grandkids, one is six and one is three years. The three year old is constantly with a naughty nose. Oh. They are on different medications, but the most problem that is bothering me, they both use ethylene. Is a Force safe? For them to use? 
There are very few drug interactions with echinoforce negatively. Um, and certainly your anti-epileptic medication is absolutely fine with echinacea. There's no evidence to suggest you can't use them together. There are one or two other drugs which you would use with caution, but certainly not epileptics. Epileptic medication, no problem at all. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for your question, Estelle. Um, I hope you heard your answer. So just around the idea that some mothers really can't breastfeed mm. um, because of other reasons, because maybe health reasons or just um, they work or the baby won't latch and it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, mm. how, can they, how can they help a situation like that? How mm. can they supplement their baby's diet if a baby's on formula? Yeah. So I think the first problem to look at there is to try and help support these mothers, you know, yeah. and to try and, and show them which avenues they can pursue to assist with the breastfeeding. So before we say, gosh, you know what, you can't breastfeed, let's just first try breastfeeding and let's try and identify what kind of barriers you're experiencing and try and help you with that. Um, and one of them is, like we said, normalizing breastfeeding, um, women seeking help sooner rather than later. You know, one of the things I feel quite passionate about is a mom seeking help, you know, because what happens is, remember, breastfeeding works on a supply and demand principle. The more you breastfeed, the more milk your body will make. Mm. And so what happens is if you have a problem, naturally you breastfeed a little bit less because you're struggling. And the less you breastfeed, the less milk you make. So then it becomes an increased problem. Yeah. So... I think it's, it's, as soon as a mom is struggling, you know, and, and I was actually explaining it to someone a little bit earlier, you know, for the first about three weeks, it's, like we said, it's hard. It really is hard. And that's when you need to make use of a lactation consultant yeah. or a dietitian or a nurse, you know, and, and work together with them to try and find a solution. You know, and worst case scenario, then you go to your healthcare professional and you say to them, look, I'm really not, I'm not coping. Or perhaps you don't want to. You know what, some yeah. mommies don't want to breastfeed. And that's also okay. Because I think what we've got to remember in all of this, breastfeeding is still a choice. So it is still the choice of the mommy. And although we know it is amazing and we know it's something that we want to encourage and, and really want everybody to do because it's an economical decision, it's an environmental decision, Absolutely. it's a health decision, you know, we still can't force people. Yeah. You know, so if a mom really makes that decision and she says, you know what, I'm, I, I'm not going to breastfeed, that's okay. Yeah. You know, and we still support you and we will still help you to make that choice and to make the most applicable choice in that situation. Yeah. And I think that also needs to be taken in a case-by-case yeah. scenario and just have that conversation okay. with your healthcare professional, yeah. an honest conversation about that with them. Thank you. So we have a call on the line from Zandi. Hello, Zandi. Welcome to Hi. Afternoon Express. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm well, thank you. What's your question or comment? Well, um, I was breastfeeding um, for about three months and I realized that my breast milk was getting less and less. And I think after three months, I didn't have any breast milk at all. So my question is, um, is there any maybe dietary things that we need to avoid that can help um, to create breast milk? And maybe is there any psychological reasons or other reasons that can influence um, breast milk? Thank you. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Gosh, so that's actually quite interesting um, that it happened, Shane, at three months to her, because that's actually very common. We often see at about three or four months that, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that are happening. So moms are returning to work, the baby's a little bit bigger, you know, perhaps some people are introducing water or food incorrectly, but that's what they're doing, you know, especially in South Africa. And, you know, and so there's a variety of reasons why the breast milk might have declined. And like I said, one of the main reasons is most likely at some point, Point, the caller must have just decreased how much she was breastfeeding for whatever reason it was, you know. Um, I mean, if we think about some of the psychological aspects of breastfeeding, even when a mom is feeling very stressed out, her yeah. breast milk supply is diminished. You right. know, and so we'll often recommend that a that a you know that the the husband rubs their back or whatever the case it's is, just so to relax sweet. them a little bit yeah. to help with the milk release. So so many things just could any happen. Any support at, goes at, a long you, way. Exactly. So, exactly. doctor, we have one more question from from you on our Facebook um, page. It says, "Hello, doctor. I have a cerebral palsy boy. Jordan has been in hospital more than he has been home during his five years of age. He gets bronchitis." and uh, pneumonia often, I'm scared that he'll become antibiotic resistant. What can I do to boost his immune system? Well, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, being in hospital is, one, is an environment where there are a lot of bugs, bugs and, and mm. resistant bacteria. So you're already you're in an environment that's 
that's a high risk environment. But um, depending on medication that he's taking, he, you know, echinacea is certainly a possibility. Um, we, we have the evidence that shows it prevents infections. Um, and, but it's something, again, that she should discuss with who, whichever pediatrician or specialist is, yes. is treating him. Um, but certainly an, an, uh, an option from, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today and educating us a little bit more on how to prevent colds and flus. <laughs> So tomorrow on the show, we have award-winning actress Linda Mdoba joining us in the, in the loft, as well as media personality Ayanda Dlamini. Uh, I hope that uh, you've been better educated on how to keep your little ones healthy throughout the winter, as well as yourself. We'll join you same time, same place, tomorrow on Afternoon Express, live on SABC3. Good night. God bless. Express, made with love by Clover. Another feel-good production.